Great. So this is the webinar gearing up for child advocacy and prevention. My name is Kat. I'm the prevention coordinator here at WICSAP. My colleague Sarah is here with me presenting as well. She's our child advocacy specialist. We collaboratively designed a new resource we're excited to walk through today with you. The purpose of the Youth Activity Guide is to increase comfort and flexibility for advocates working with child survivors of sexual assault and for prevention programs with young children. A little bit about WICSAP. The Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs is a nonprofit organization that strives to unite agencies engaged in the elimination of sexual violence. WICSAP provides information, training, and expertise to program and individual members who support victims, family and friends, the general public, and all those whose lives have been affected by sexual violence. Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the things that we're producing and releasing in our media statements. We want to just share with you the goals of today's webinar. The objectives are to increase capacity to serve child survivors aged 5 to 12 by reinforcing core values of advocacy, to increase capacity to design and implement kid-focused prevention programming that aligns with other adult and community-focused child sexual abuse prevention efforts, and to help folks implement the Youth Activity Guide. We want to acknowledge that several of you submitted questions, which is really exciting and helpful for us. Some of them were not necessarily things that will be covered in today's webinar. They're definitely related topics, such as supporting caregivers, working um, with risk reduction for children. None of those will be covered in today's webinar. So we just want to be really clear with you that these are definitely things we are happy to talk with you about, but just won't be covered today. If you're working at a sexual assault program in Washington State, we're your technical assistance provider, which really just means we're here to help you do your work the best that you can do it. So we're happy to do that over the phone or through email or come to your program and meet with you in person. And if you're not at a sexual assault program in Washington State and you aren't sure who to contact for assistance, we're happy to help connect you to the right group or person to do that work. So first, we wanted to get a little bit of a pulse about who is on the call with us today. So we've got a quick poll, and if you could just kind of share primarily what your role is. Are you a sexual assault advocate who works primarily with children and youth? Are you a general sexual assault advocate? Are you a sexual assault preventionist? Are you another staff person at a sexual assault program? Or are you a staff person at another family, domestic violence, or crime victim service program? or some other type of category that we haven't captured here that you want to share with us. So we'll wait just a moment as you take that poll. like almost all of you have started to answer the poll, so let's just see who's here. It looks like about half of you are providing sexual advocacy, so that's great. You're definitely a large part of our target audience today and a huge audience for uh, WICSAP as a whole, so we're really excited to have you here. And for those of you coming from other fields, we're really excited to share this piece of information with you and um, imagine how it can probably still be applicable to the work you're doing. So as we said before, really we want to encourage you to let us know if you have any questions, if you want some clarification, use that chat feature and Sarah and I will pause as much as we can to make sure that this information is really useful to you. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Um, again, um, I am here um, with Kat. My name is uh, Sarah Murray and I um, focus on child sexual, um, child sexual assault advocacy at WICSAP. Um, where we're going to start um, with my part is um, what is child advocacy? Just going over some of the basics um, so we understand the framework as we go into understanding how to use the guide. Um, so what is it? Um, the primary goals of child advocacy is to promote growth or reconnect children to themselves after a traumatic event. Um, to uh, promote positive outcomes as much as possible, uh, and always to stay very near the general core values of advocacy. 
So providing choices and support regardless of what the client chooses. And then also, of course, navigating systems such as criminal justice, um, schools and education, and um, family systems. Okay, great. Okay, so what are the barriers? Um, so what the feedback that we get from advocates about um, some of the barriers of doing specifically child advocacy include things like um, fear of doing more harm than good. And that's a great question, and that is a really important um, position to be coming from, making sure that we are working hard to promote positive outcomes, not negative ones, and um, focusing on that. But it can also be a barrier for people to try um, to provide child advocacy in general. Um, it can be hard working with kids, thinking that as this one person, you are going to dictate that outcome completely. It's not the case. So. Um, something that we hear from people is that um, because they're not trained as therapists, they feel that they might be inadequate or underprepared, and therefore they don't engage in ongoing services. Um, that's why it's important to remember what the core values of advocacy are, what the role of an advocate is, and why advocates exist in relation to therapists, who also provide a very important um, healing role. Advocates also have a very different role that children deserve as well. Okay, great. Okay. And then um, another thing that we hear from people is uh, just the, the fear of just working with kids, that it is um, emotionally harder labor to do, uh, which can be true in some cases, but um, overall it appears to be more scary than it usually is. Um, rarely with young children especially um, do advocates actually ever hear the details of the assault. Um, in general, we, we just work on um, issues related to it, but not directly to. So we might talk to a child about um, feeling afraid of the dark or those kinds of things, not necessarily about the, we don't hear the details. So it's not as triggering as people usually expect it to be. Okay. And then um, being unsure of what to do in the session. Um, so a lot of people talk about, too, that you know what to do with an adult in an appointment because they come in and tell you usually what they want to work on. Their goals are a lot clearer. That's not true usually with children. Um, so people don't know what to do at that time. Um, that's why we have developed a guide to start, um, to give people a starting place. Um, you need to be flexible and still follow what the child wants. So it's really similar to engaging with adult survivors, asking kids what they want to do with you. Um, and then making sure that um, yeah, your, your sessions are flexible, that kind of thing. Um, and that really child advocacy can be just about promoting fun, um, just having fun with kids, um, just playing with them, um, Utilizing the advocacy session to talk about just everyday kid things in life, um, just learning to um, negotiate with adults, all of those kinds of things. Okay, moving forward. Does that all make sense so far? Okay, I do general check-ins. It's like that's my style. Um, okay, another barrier that we hear about is a, a lack of child clients. So some questions to think about um, when uh, evaluating why there might be a lack of child clients is um, what kind of specific community outreach and education are needed in your community? How do you find out about those needs? Who comes to the table to tell you um, what's needed? Um, where, um, where relationships are being currently built and who is making referrals? So. Um, it's different in every community. Um, resource officers can be helpful um, in school systems. Um, it might just be one guidance counselor that you start getting a bulk of referrals from. Um, and uh, we can help you think of more creative ideas if um, those professions don't seem to be um, worth energy at this moment to build in. And then also making sure that uh, are we ready? Are you ready to start serving, um, especially five to 12 year olds, if they do come through your door? So making sure that the capacity and trauma-informed knowledge to respond to child survivors is in place before 
we spend time building community outreach and referrals. Okay. And so then um, the last um, barrier to go over today is um, advocates sometimes will talk about not being sure where their role differs from where a therapist's role is, that they uh, become uncertain when they're providing therapy and that's um, inappropriate. So um, some things to think about uh, when it comes to that is um, therapy is looking to cure trauma symptoms. Advocacy is looking to help manage trauma symptoms in this moment. We're not looking into layers of emotion or processing. We're focusing on current everyday life issues that a client wants to focus on. Um, it can be beyond just an immediate response to. Um, a lot of times with child advocacy, um, advocates think that they only have value um, showing up at systems meetings, um, but it is important to provide meaningful ongoing advocacy if wanted by the client, the same way that we do for adults. Okay, so yeah, next point. We're into in practice. So um, different uh, spheres of advocacy can look like one-on-one um, -on -one peer advocacy appointments, um, medical or legal appointments. We can also advocate in school systems, um, say if there's like a bullying situation or something like that, and um, a child client is okay with you going with them to talk to um, their uh, teacher and parent, that's something that we can do. Um, we can help locate community resources the same way. Obviously, we have to go through a parent to some degree, um, but we can also talk to kids about what they think their needs are. Um, and then supporting non-offending caregivers. Um, structuring of appointments should always be flexible, the same way that we do for adult survivors. Um, but some ways to start to figure out what's going to work between you and this particular client, um, you can do emotional check-ins or you can do body scans, which are um, their examples of um, there are examples of in both the guide and then also in the advocacy station paper, uh, Child Advocacy and Practice. And then um, you can discuss what the client wants and move forward with that, do a corresponding activity. Um, it can be helpful to have some time set aside for quiet reflection or journaling or coloring, if that's what they're into. Um, and then ending the session with a fun activity. Um, so it can be anything that they want. If they want to dance, watch baby go videos, whatever sounds good to them. Um, but also always being flexible, that if this isn't the structure that they want, then we just follow them. We follow them and where they want to go. Okay. okay, so the core values of child advocacy. They look very similar to uh, core values of advocacy in general. Um, there's just specifics to keep in mind with working with children. So, self-determination. Um, this is one of the main focuses of advocacy and what we do. Um, Self-determination is providing choices and pathways for survivors to choose their own path, They're, make decisions for themselves, and we assist in that decision-making process and supporting that decision. Um, it's a, it comes from an empowerment model, um, so helping people feel more able to move forward in their decision. Um, and so how we can do that with children is asking questions like, does a child want to receive services? Um, do they have all of the control over their participation? Um, a caregiver can be pushing services or feel like services are necessary. Um, if the child does not feel the same way, an advocate can advocate for what the child wants, which if it's not services at this time, that's what we advocate for, for them. Um, always maintaining honesty and respect, um, and then confidentiality. Um, so, for example, like um, having two different advocates for the caregiver and for the, the child um, when possible is always important. Making sure that um, we don't give information to a caregiver um, if a client tells us, a child client tells us something. Um, maintaining those uh, same levels of confidentiality um, with children is also very important. 
um, and then um, validating and believing our clients. So this is really important and can get sometimes more complicated with children when um, if systems know that an advocate is working with a child, um, a lot of system partners, uh, law enforcement, parents, um, teachers feel like they need to tell you something about that client. So for example, um, if the child is having um, um, explosive reactions at home, a parent might feel like it's important to tell the advocate about that. Um, if the advocate chooses to follow up with that, with the child, and the child says everything is fine at home, and they're not having any sort of anger, you believe who is in front of you. That's, what, that's the most important thing that advocates can do, is you just believe them. We're not looking to investigate, we're not looking to validate realities, we just, or challenge realities, we're looking to validate realities that way. So, um, we believe the kid, we move forward. Okay. And then also, um, this can be true for adult survivors too, but it's um, specifically important for uh, child survivors to, um, uh, one of the values of advocacy can be to play, to be a safe place to explore and to, uh, to have fun. Um, why it's important, especially when it comes to trauma-informed services, is that one of the longest term uh, consequences of childhood sexual assault is um, not actually being able to play as adults, which is a lifetime skill. Um, and then also uh, correlative uh, difficulties, like um, being very rigid and not being able to be spontaneous. Um, when we're allowing people to have free exploratory play, they actually start to build additional um, networks separate from their trauma experience, and that's one of the things that can be most helpful when it comes to trauma recovery. And it's just fun. So it's less scary for everyone. It's less scary for the advocate, and it's less scary for the client. Great. Thanks, Sarah. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what prevention with children looks like. So we want to acknowledge that this is really a shift away from typical child sexual abuse programming that has focused on awareness and early reporting of abuse. Um, since we're operating under a primary prevention model, and that requires us to really dig at the root causes and try to stop it before it begins. So what we know is that really means looking at perpetration and changing behaviors and systems that support and reinforce perpetration. So it's not up to children to protect themselves to prevent their own abuse. It doesn't mean that some level of risk reduction can't be beneficial, it certainly can. We just wanna be really clear that when we're talking about primary prevention with children, we're really shifting kind of the model that has been the norm and that the programming that we're doing with kids is really focused on increasing the skills to help them develop into healthy young adults and to help the community shift norms and expectations around children and around child sexual abuse. And so that can be a little bit of a shift, but we really did want to come up with a toolkit that can be used with kids age 5 to 12 because a thing we hear all the time in the field is that we know that we want to start this work sooner, that we want to be able to actually reach a larger number of people who haven't experienced violence already. And while it might seem challenging that we're ever going to have a group that doesn't have some level of trauma already existing, we can hopefully reach children at a younger age, help them build resiliency, build protective factors, strengthen them as a community, because we know that peer support is also a really big component of primary prevention. And so that's another component of the work that we're doing here with this age group is to build these young people into communities that can reject and hold, reject violence, hold perpetrators accountable, and really help promote healthy and safe norms. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of our big foundational pieces, and now we want to talk about putting this work into practice. So it says, let's unpack that. <laughs> but before we unpack it, does anyone have any questions they want to share in the chat feature kind of about these philosophies that are grounding the work we're talking about today? I'll wait just a moment to see if anyone types anything in and then we'll move on. Okay, let's move on and talk about 
what some of the practical pieces are around doing child advocacy and doing prevention with kids 5 to 12. Okay, so these are just some um, larger things that uh, advocates can do to feel better prepared uh, to do child advocacy appointments. Um, one of the key things that we can do is just learn more about um, developmental and cognitive development of, of children. Um, the more that you feel like you understand them and know where they are, the easier it is to meet them and provide them services, meet them where they are. And I'll just point out for everyone that Sarah has put together this really useful chart on developmental stages for kids 5 to 12. It's included at the very end of our activity guide in the appendix, and it's also available on our website. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and so that chart really just highlights some of the more relevant um, developmental stages for advocacy, but really the more you become an expert and um, learn about it, the more comfortable you'll feel with uh, using these concepts in practice. Um, being ready for um, multifaceted abuse. So sometimes uh, there is just uh, childhood sexual assault that um, as the trauma experience. Often uh, it's going to be correlated with um, potentially other types of childhood abuse. So being ready for that as well. Um, what your resources are, um, how it makes, um, how it changes trauma, that childhood neglect, um, has a very have very specific um, develop, developmental and neurological um, consequences that can uh, be separate from childhood sexual assault or be compounded by childhood sexual assault. So the same thing. The more that you know, the more you'll feel better to um, you'll feel better prepared. And so then also um, feeling really comfortable in being able to provide trauma-informed services. The key part about trauma-informed services is understanding about trauma. So the more that you can learn about trauma, how trauma impacts children, um, how it impacts people as they become adults too. Um, another key area that we see here, uh, adult childhood survivors, um, and knowing how we can best provide services to them comes from understanding the best we can about trauma. Um, you can also, you can contact WICSAP to get more information about that. Um, another good example would be um, pediatric units and hospitals are usually um, very, uh, very good at building uh, physically safe and comfortable spaces for young children. And so being prepared for flexibility, um, having something prepared ahead of time that you think might be useful to work on, but being ready and happy to accept if a child rejects that preparation that you've done and being able to go with the flow on that. And so the same thing that the more prepared you are, the better you'll be able to be adaptive when they don't want to do what you thought you were going to do that day. Great. So I want to cover really quickly with you some key points about designing a prevention plan with children. So the first thing to say about that is that it really isn't that different than the basic best practice principles we use in designing prevention programs overall. And we want to be really clear that this guide is not a curriculum. It does not need to be implemented in any particular order. All the sessions don't have to be used. It's really a guidebook to pull from as you build a program. And so some things to consider while you're building your program with children um, are to think about the design really thoughtfully. So utilizing the nine principles are a great place to start to meet those delivery and structure best practices, such as them being multi-session, using varied teaching tools, it being culturally and linguistically appropriate, and the other six, of course, too. <laughs> Another useful tool in the prevention uh, toolbox is a social ecological model. Uh, that really reinforces the need to design your program with a wide sphere of influence. The most effective work happens when it impacts individuals, the people they have relationships with, their community, and where it's reflected in society as well. And while it's not always attainable to work on that outermost level of society, those first three are things you really can include in the design of your program. So for example, with this tool that we're talking about today, 
This is a useful place to start doing individual education and skill building with children. There are plenty of activities that work on the peer relationship between kids and other kids, reinforcing empathetic tendencies, really um, supporting healthy, well-rounded behavior. But it's also important to complement this with activities and programs that target caregivers, also include the school culture and environment, other community culture and environments. And so this is really one piece of a much more comprehensive plan, hopefully, to help promote healthy children, empower families, and engage communities. It's also a really useful tool that can be used to align with adult-focused child sexual abuse prevention efforts. Uh, many years ago, now we started a prevention pilot program in our state, implementing a curriculum called Where We Live. We had about a dozen different sex assault programs around the state take part in that. And one of the pieces that became really important in that work with the parents and caregivers was that the messages and the values and the skills have to be reinforced with the kids. And while we were asking the caregivers to do these little mini activities at home, we knew that there could be so much more else given to the kids too. And so we started creating this compilation of activities and that helped really inform the guide. Mm -hmm. So we wanna go through and tell you a little more about the guide. The purpose is to increase the comfort and flexibility for advocates working with child survivors. In Washington State, it's required that agencies provide adequate direct services to child survivors. We know that sometimes it can be intimidating to work with children and that advocates are cautious to not do further harm. The guide provides tangible and adaptable suggestions for activities and conversations that are developmentally appropriate to use with child clients. These are not clinical or treatment activities. They are healthy development skills to support survivors in healing and beyond. And on the complementary side for prevention, you'll notice that safety education and early identification of abuse of children is not included in this guide. It's still a useful component for some communities to make sure that children understand they have rights, they know safe people that they can disclose to, they believe that they are valuable and that they should be able to say no and that that should be heard. But we know that that isn't enough either to actually prevent perpetration. And so this guide is really focused on building skills for children to turn into healthy adults and communities. All of the activities are designed for ages five through 12, um, but we'll share a little bit more about how we've identified per activity the age range. Mm -hmm. um, and then some activities are um, primarily focused for advocacy, some are primarily focused for prevention, and some can be adapted to go um, both ways. And that's also highlighted at the uh, beginning of each activity. Yep. So there are 10 sections in the binder. If you have the physical binder, and if not, you'll see the 10 sections identified in the online PDF version as well. They are icebreakers and fun activities, reflection and self-esteem, emotional identification, emotional regulation and safety, empathy, boundaries and consent, gender expectations, relationships, sexual development and bodies, and additional resources. And we just wanted to highlight that while we probably can all agree these sound great and these are good skills, we do want to acknowledge they are all rooted in the best available evidence we have in the fields of child development, in child sexual abuse prevention, about risk and protective factors for sexual violence perpetration. Mm -hmm. And all of those fields are referenced um, in the back, in the appendix, you can read more about the developmental assets framework, more about child development stages, mm -hmm. um, and get some reinforcement there, too, to help strengthen your argument as you present this to communities and families as well. So here's a little screenshot of one of the section headings. So it's the reflection and self-esteem headings. So we've hopefully designed this in a way that's very easy to use. Each section includes some purpose about why this is an important topic. We've highlighted whatever research or field knowledge has really informed this section being important. Any specific considerations that might exist in an advocacy or prevention lens. And then a list of the activities that are included. 
And then similarly, the activities are also formatted in a way, hopefully, that are very easy to follow to get you started. We include information about the age range of that activity. Some are the entire age range of the binder, 5 to 12, like in the example here. Some are more designed for a 9 to 12-year-old older age range. There's a lot of variability throughout the guide. We give you our estimate, our best estimate of the time needed to do this activity. That will, of course, change, though, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one advocacy session or a group prevention activity. So facilitators, depending on the role you're sitting in when you use this activity, will have to really think about ways in which that dynamic will either increase or decrease your time. Any other considerations outside of the time for advocacy or prevention are included whenever they're applicable. The materials that you need, the instructions, and any other facilitator notes we've thought that might be useful for you to know before you do the activity. And we included any worksheets that are necessary to do the activity. Uh, some of them require you to purchase materials, but there are lots to choose from, so you can really pick and choose based on the budget you have in your program as well. And we want to share a couple of tips we've put together to help you get started thinking about the guide. Yes. So, um, the first tip is to practice. Um, practice using the, the activities. Um, you can uh, role play them with uh, coworkers. I know most people um, resist role playing, but it can be really helpful. Um, do the activities yourself. Um, see how it feels for you to do them, what value you got out of it, if anything. Um, everything speaks to people differently, and the ones that you feel more, um, that you have more buy-in with, you will help communicate that to your client. Um, becoming more comfortable. So. Um, a lot of uh, the activities here are guided conversations, um, and an advocate is setting the tone on normalizing these topics. So when it comes to talking about healthy sexuality or boundaries, um, the more comfortable the advocate and preventionist is talking about these, we set the tone. We normalize that conversation. Um, so same thing, practice it, uh, get used to it, talk to other people, talk to your coworkers. Um, Use them as your audience. See how, see how what you're saying sounds. You don't need to have all the answers, of course, um, but we should be able to freely talk about the value of these activities or the value of these topics. Paying attention to cues is really important, especially with child clients. Um, making sure that we um, are reading as best as we can our clients' verbal and nonverbal cues for guidance on possible topics. Um, you can also use cues to guide when a topic or activity is done. Um, you can always revisit the topic in a later session if it seems like the client is now just interested in it. Being very aware of things like ageism, um, it can be really easy for advocates to slide into thinking that um, we know what especially a child client needs to do or needs to do next or needs to learn. Um, but we stay rooted in those core values of we follow our client where they want to go, even for kids. Um, sometimes that's like, usually it's easier for advocates to do that with their adult clients, and it gets a little harder for, um, for child clients, so really paying attention to that. Um, children might also um, have feelings about authority and not saying no um, to an advocate just as being an adult and being um, someone who's clearly in a position of power. Um, so making sure that we are building spaces for them to give us both verbal and nonverbal cues. So, and then, um, just knowing too that um, it would be very rare for especially a young survivor, so from the ages of five to 12, um, to meet with an advocate and um, state that they have problems with boundaries and they would like to work with that, work on that, um, the way that we see with adult survivors. Most of the time, child survivors are not going to be able to process or articulate difficulties in their life in that way. So there is a, a lot of exploring that advocates need to be able to do. And so practicing, um, practicing that with, uh, with peers can be really helpful as well. And so, um, 
the last thing, or one of the last things about this is that mm -hmm. this guide is in no way exhaustive. List of things that we can do with uh, child clients, either in advocacy or in prevention. The topics were chosen with intention, um, but please feel free to adapt them um, in any ways that you feel like need to, or if you need to expand on them. Some sections are more robust than others. Um, that's just part of like how things worked out for us and then what we just felt like needed to spend more time on, but that's the same thing. That's just how we feel about it. A child client that you might be working with might not be on the same page with us. Um, so being prepared to expand the sections if you are working with someone who really wants to focus in on that specific topic. Okay, so um, also with being um, being flexible um, and not exhaustive, um, we where am I? Oh, sorry, hold on one second. Okay, okay, I found where I am. Thank you. All right. Um, again, it's important to um, in prevention, like uh, like Kat has said, just to reiterate, this is not a curriculum. Um, pulling from sections as you as you as you'd like that seems um, to be more useful. Um, making sure that it's strategically done and uh, built upon um, each lesson is important. Um, and then, when it comes to choosing topics for advocacy, um, you might think that you need to address certain topics, and it's fine to present them as an option. But ultimately, remembering to um, honor a client's ideas and what they find most important. And then also, for prevention, if it seems like you're sticking to one aspect um, in the entire guide more often, that's fine. That's great. Um, skill building takes time. So if you're working with a group of kids and you guys are really sticking to boundaries, that's great. Great. Thanks, Sarah. We do have a question that I think it would be good to bring up before we move on. Um, we have someone ask us the question, if a staff, uh, when staff are in the, either in a role of being a child advocate or a preventionist, are they considered mandated reporters of child abuse? In the state of Washington, yes. However, since that does, there are some variability from state to state. Um, if you are not in Washington state, definitely contact your sexual assault coalition. Mm -hmm. They should be able to give you information on that. And Sarah and I and our whole advocacy staff here at WICSAP would be happy to talk through kind of the nuances of mandated reporting mm -hmm. with any of you here in Washington that want to talk about what does that really look like in practice, how does that impact my role. It's definitely an important question and one that we do get often, so please definitely feel free to talk to us more about that so you feel really comfortable with what that means. Yes, um, especially um, as mandatory reporters here, making sure that we are following through with our requirement to be mandatory reporters in the most trauma-informed and empowered way we can with survivors. And that's definitely something that we would love to help with. Do you guys have any other questions before we talk about the sections of the guide? And I'll just also share, because I've um, shared this in some of the chat questions that have come up. If you do run into any questions, um, or trouble identifying where to find any of the activities, just let us know. Um, you know, we did our best to hopefully make this very easy to use, but we don't doubt that there are some things we forgot to include or that may have been missed, um, and we'd be happy to make sure you can find what you need. So another question that has come up is about what type of training would you recommend for facilitators prior to implementation? <laughs> well, if it's um, in the context of prevention, we would definitely suggest feeling really comfortable with some of the um, foundational roots of prevention so you can understand and design your program well. Because like I shared before, this activity guide is not from curriculum. It's just a really a menu of options to pull from, so it's really still up to you to take stock of what the needs are in your particular community with the audience you'll be working with to identify what are the top issues that are bubbling to the surface. Because even though we have this pretty robust list of risk factors, we know that in each community there are going to be different dynamics that 
are the most salient for folks about why sexual violence is a problem in our community. So I think it's a really important process to engage in before you start just delivering something, is to really identify some key stakeholders to help inform what it's really look like here. What do we think some of the deeper roots are right here with these people that we want to work with so that we can identify what are the skills that will be the most useful for us to build? We do offer a five-hour prevention orientation online course um, through our website that you can take if you're new to prevention. Um, but outside of that, I think just any type of facilitator training you come across is useful. Because even though designing the prevention program takes a lot of this other knowledge, delivering it as a trainer for any topic or as a preventionist really is about how you connect with audiences, how you're flexible, and those skills are also going to be really important for advocates as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, the additions that I would uh, add for advocates would be um, one of the best ways to find out where you need more help um, or where you're missing information is to look at some of the resources that exist. Um, and anything that doesn't make sense, um, contact WICSTEP about, get more information on, do, do the research around it. Um, for example, in the Advocacy Station paper, uh, Child Advocacy in Practice, um, that highlights a lot of the different areas where an advocate might be uh, working with a child survivor um, and go through that and see, oh, is this news to me? Is this something that I didn't know before? Um, are these spaces in systems I haven't really thought about how I would um, have to advocate in, those kinds of things? Um, it's a really wide range of possible areas to get more training on or to um, to, to learn in. Everything from um, like working with informal systems like um, maybe their religious institution and how to advocate there to all the way to what are common concerns for, for children and how they express them. Um, so finding out where you feel like you didn't know that or um, that you feel uncomfortable with explaining to somebody else about are good areas to see where you might need training on. Um, and then also, especially when it comes to working with children, um, I really would recommend um, finding spaces to engage with children um, in a less formal space. So um, volunteering, you know, if you have a friend who is um, like a teacher in a school and they need help shepherding a school dance, like just getting used to talking to kids, seeing what, what's already naturally around you where you're not wearing your advocate role, you're just engaging with children. Um, and the more comfortable you get with how they talk, how they act, what they do, um, you can also then see, you, that's part of practicing, it's just practicing of, of, work, of being around children and how they work. I think in that practice piece that Sarah did mention earlier in the tips, but that also feels like a really important training kind of tip as well, is just whatever the activities are, whether you're going to be using them in advocacy sessions or you're going to be building them into your own curriculum, is actually really practicing each activity. I know that role playing is so uncomfortable. I've been there too. I always dread it a little bit as a participant. However, there have been so many studies that show that people retain the information in a much more valuable way when they do it through role play. So I think, you know, either if you can with your colleagues or if you need to do it outside of work with friends or family, really just like going through the activities that you've picked out of the binder that you think you want to use or any activities you find and feeling really comfortable with explaining them feeling comfortable answering questions about them, modifying them, all of those kind of things I think are just going to make you come off as a much smoother trainer, for sure. So we're going to jump into the first section of the guide, the icebreakers and fun activities. <laughs> so outside of it just being a good time and something that people enjoy doing, the real goal here is to build rapport, either with your client or with the group and between group members. And yes, it's supposed to be light and fun, but it can also support meaningful ongoing relationships, both in advocacy and in prevention. Um, especially, so something to think about in the prevention world is that it can be more than just a fun activity. If you pick your icebreaker really strategically and even modify some of the ones that we've provided to you, 
you can really align it with your learning objectives of your curriculum. So you could either use an, act, an icebreaker to be kind of the introduction to today's lesson, or you might find it more valuable for it to be the check back in from last time. You know, let, like last time we talked about gender, and before we move into relationships today, we're going to do this icebreaker, you know, that has to do with thinking about gender roles and gender expectations and giving people a chance to kind of maybe reapply the skills you built during your last session. You know, and so a really great, easy icebreaker that I think can be so adaptable for whatever your topics are is a big beach ball. You can fill in questions on the beach ball, and you can mix it up. A couple of them can be really fun about what someone's favorite ice cream is. So it's not all educational questions, right? I mean, you want to make, make sure it's still fun and it just builds rapport, but then you can also put in some questions. So maybe you're really focusing on empathy. And so you put a question on your beach ball that, you know, says share an example of when you really changed the way you responded based on something someone shared or something like that, where you pull a couple of questions that are really meaty and really valuable and you toss them into this mix of other questions. So you're helping people get ready for the lesson and also letting them kind of show what they've learned um, and apply it in a way that feels really real to them. And I think there's also a lot of other, like, deep connections that are made in the advocacy realm as well. Yes. Yeah. So um, in addition to um, just making the, uh, the relationship and the appointments less scary for both the advocate and the client um, and just having fun, um, fun is very useful. Um, the actual the idea of fun, the concept of fun as a trauma response um, like mentioned before, um, survivors can often have a difficult time freely playing or freely having fun. So providing a safe space to be able to explore is incredibly important. And making sure that we aren't just a person that they see and have to talk about hard things every time they see us. We want to balance that out. Um, also something to think about very strategically with it is um, how you can use knowing what games and what, what they like to do for fun as you move forward in different systems. So for an example, if you have a client whose case is actually moving forward in the criminal justice system, um, when they need to start meeting with the um, prosecutor for, um, before they go to trial, it can be incredibly helpful, especially for younger children, to do the same thing, to have fun, to do some icebreakers, um, and it can be helpful when you already know what they like to do for fun and be prepared for that when you go to the office with them. Um, and then also, this can be part of the benefit of just providing ongoing services. It is okay if what we mostly focus on with kids is having fun and just building a safe space for them, um, especially if they're working with other systems um, because what is not helpful is if the only time they see their advocate is at formal legal appointments, all we are then is just another adult that they don't know, that they probably don't like, that they don't trust. So if we actually want to be able to advocate, especially for children in different spheres, we have to build a meaningful relationship ahead of time. This isn't always necessarily true for adults who might feel very supportive and might feel that you have a lot of credibility and they, they trust you um, when you just show up to meet them for a no contact order hearing. That is definitely possible with adults. It's not as likely with children when it's already very scary and intimidating. The next section in our guide is called reflection and self-esteem. And so really here we're helping young people explore the concept, the concept of identity. We're focusing on building healthy self-esteem, um, and that these are some of the core pieces that we can really help children develop that will have ripple effects as they grow up. Yeah. Okay, so um, children, just like adult survivors, um, may really want you to just tell them what they need to do or what's best for them. Um, we already know that this exists and happens, but um, 
when it comes to kids, there are specific reasons why it might happen. Um, the tendency to defer to adults. They've been taught to listen to adults or that adults provide guidance um, and advice. Um, that they uh, don't have past models of trauma recovery to reflect on or establish. Um, and that um, really one of the key parts when it comes to trauma response is that um, we see people become alienated from themselves, both emotionally and physically, and it may become hard to trust your own judgment. Um, and that's true for children as well. Um, so why we focused um, when it comes to promoting or providing advocacy, a section of reflection and self-esteem is that um, we are looking to help child survivors reconnect with themselves. And that includes the basics the very basics, what their likes are, what their dislikes are, um, how, um, how to feel comfortable with themselves, what, how they want to talk to other people, just what everything about themselves might be needing to be reestablished. Um, so we can work on the very basic ground level aspect of this with children. So figuring things out like um, what they like about themselves or journaling or who they are and working on different forms of expression. Um, so, yes. And I think connected to that on the prevention side, um, one of the things that we have to be thinking about is how do we really change perpetration behaviors before they come to fruition. And so we obviously know that telling people that sexual violence is bad and wrong is not a deterrent. And so we have to get really deep and think about the, the deep aspects that are developed at a very young age that contribute to, not in isolation individually, but really compounding together to create an environment that supports perpetration. So part of this is about developing a strong sense of self and a sense of worth that can sometimes lessen the likelihood to use violence and power and control over others to find that sense of place and find that sense of worth. Um, this is also a really, really useful skill in terms of supporting active bystanders, so that they are capable and um, willing to be those vocal bystanders. And that building self-esteem is a really important piece of building a healthy community. And the little bit of research we do have available on protective factors, emotional health and connectedness mm -hmm. is considered a protective factor. So really focusing on this, these factors at a young age is a really great start in the prevention work we can do. Um, just to reemphasize one piece about this, um, a disconnection from oneself is one of the most common and long-term aspects of a trauma response. Um, when we see the neurological research about that, the parts of your brain that house your own identity, um, how you feel about yourself, what you think, who you are, um, those are usually diminished. And so when I, like, it is about reconnecting, re-getting to know yourself, especially in this new format. Um, a lot of times we hear survivors talk about they want to go to how things were before. There's a lot of concepts about this that we can help people explore. What does that mean for them? What if it's not possible to go back to how they were before? We help people find meaning and, pay, and, you know, and think long-term and critically about what's going on for them. Um, that's one of the important parts about advocacy is that survivors um, often can, same thing we see in the neurological research, the parts of your brain that help you critically think or when you're in um, a really large moment of uh, anxiety or depression, everyone has a hard time thinking long-term and critically. So an advocate's role, even with children, is to how, help play that out. What does that look like in practice? You know, ask exploratory questions and explore with them. Um, the activities that we've picked in this section um, are especially meant to help explore these concepts. They're not an end-all activity. You're not going to do an I am poem and then feel like you've regained yourself. Um, but it is going to potentially help start that exploration. So we picked out just one of the activities in this section called the self-affirmation art. There's a little fun graphic of these stones where people write a message or a quick phrase to themselves. So we picked this one out just to reinforce the value of focusing on these skills, but it might seem like a really just cute, quick, non-important craft activity, 
but that we really want to emphasize how it can be a powerful tool to help change your mood, your state of mind, manifest the change you desire in your life when you're a survivor or as another young person who's saturated in a world of trauma as well, that we know that even non-survivors are impacted by all of the trauma around them. And so doing these types of activities to really ground people to themselves and to the version of themselves that they feel that they really want to aspire towards is so meaningful. And we wanted to just also highlight things such as, like, in a prevention group, this might be the sole source of confidence building and encouragement the young person gets. So this actually can be a really, really deeply connected, important activity, even though to them it probably just seems really fun. Um, and also just to offer the caveat in both circumstances of one-on-one -on -one sessions and group sessions, you know, that you don't know all of the dynamics and you may know none of the dynamics of what's going on at home. And so just to be thoughtful about when you actually are creating an item like this or something similar to this, to consider if you're doing it in a classroom, can they all be kept in their desks? Maybe it's not great for people to take it home. Um, can you hang on to them? Um, you know, or are there other ways to create something smaller or less permanent that's just still for the moment? So just really thinking through some of those considerations for this activity, and that's going to be true for a lot of the other activities, too. Yeah. Um, and in addition for this activity um, specifically, uh, some of the ways that it can also be used and how it relates to um, trauma recovery is that we know that when individuals um, – are building a sense of spirituality, whatever that spirituality looks like. It can be literally anything. Um, and community, that becomes a really useful resiliency factor and recovery factor. Um, people who identify as having some form of spirituality, um, we usually see a reduction in their trauma symptoms. Um, and then also, thinking about how you can use these things strategically. If um, you're working with a child and it seems like their case might be able to move forward, Early on, if you make one of these items, that's potentially an item that they can hold while they're either going through deposition or through um, testifying. So the more importance that we place on it, the more value we place on it earlier on, the more helpful it can be also long-term for them. The next section in our guide is emotional identification. This section is really designed to help reconnect and recognize emotional experiences, impact the or understand the impact of trauma of emotionally expressing and interpretation. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, great. So, okay. So basically, when it comes to the advocacy side of things, um, one thing that we know for sure about um, childhood trauma is that, and also adult trauma, but definitely also true. Um, for childhood survivors is that um, as part of the disconnection from oneself, it's also very hard to um, identify your own emotions. We see that with survivors all of the time. It's very hard to identify how you're feeling. It's part of the no longer being housed in yourself. So um, what we are working on is uh, with them is to um, help practice um, recognizing their affect, uh, affect is their emotion, and then also to figure out how they want to regulate their affect. Affect regulation is one of the also long-term difficulties we see for survivors. Uh, this one, especially affect regulation, becomes very difficult. It's the going from like one to 10, when things don't make sense to go from one to 10. Um, it's part of the biological neurological uh, system that they have now is um, when you go, you go very hard. It's part of like trying to remain safe. Uh, so one of the things that we have in here, too, is a really focus on um, making sure that we're not just paying attention to the mind side of emotions, but also how emotions are embodied. Um, this is normally a new concept for Western culture uh, people. Um, you can see this more, too, in different, different types of cultures um, where this might alter the part of their practice, and they might be trying to communicate something to you by saying that they have a very upset stomach or a part of their body really hurts or is feeling a certain way. Um, if we only look at that from a biological perspective and not from an emotional perspective, we might be missing what our client is telling us. Um, and they might be missing it too, especially for young children. Um, they probably don't have this already established framework that emotions are both something that you experience in your mind and in your body. So, um, we have some activities in here that are meant specifically to do that, to talk about 
where an emotion is in your body. One thing that I want to emphasize really quickly um, is the relationship with anger. Um, often um, what we hear is that um, you need to stop being angry and you need to forgive an offender to be able to have any ability to move forward in your healing. Um, that's not necessarily true. Um, and also it really um, it villainizes anger as an emotion. Um, anger can obviously um, contribute to people making poor decisions, but at its base, I think it's really important to understand that anger tells us um, what a boundary is, right? If someone steals something from you and you feel angry about it, what, that, what that's doing at its base is communicating to you that you weren't okay with that. Um, so it's important, especially when working with children, to be able to recognize anger and respond to it appropriately um, when it comes to that. But making sure that we're not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Devaluing someone's experience. Um, anger can uh, also be really motivating for survivors. Um, when you're mad about what happened to you, it will carry you very far in, um, in responding. Um, we see it most commonly, the survivors that are angry about their experience um, will often be able to uh, handle the barriers in the criminal justice system or are um, able to try more than survivors that don't, feel, that don't feel angry. So it can be very useful, just making sure that we understand that, that all emotions have a use, um, and to not try to um, devalue or diminish that in someone. Okay, so. And then the only other prevention piece just want to really quickly kind of highlight with this section is just to consider the overlap that this has with gender expectations. Mm -hmm. What type of impact do rigid gender norms have on the ways that we support or challenge the way young people express their emotions and the way they feel about their feelings. Um, and so you might want to think about in a prevention series kind of how do you acknowledge several of these different components within other activities. The next section is emotional regulation and safety. So this mm -hmm. section is about coping with feelings, how to build skills to manage your emotions, promote self-soothing, self-soothing, and to build skills to communicate nonviolently. Yes. Um, so this is a good example of where advocacy differs from uh, therapy. Emotional regulation and safety, um, the ones that advocates, advocates are going to focus on, are very basic life skills that all children um, usually need help in promoting and developing, um, sometimes adults as well. So, um, this isn't a treatment model. The things that we have in here are very basic. We're not responding, we're not processing the trauma, we're just building, uh, we're building normal life skills that may have been impacted, kind of thrown off the rails by a trauma experience. So we stay in that world. Um, so um, what we're trying to do when it comes to emotional regulation, uh, like I mentioned before, and this is an example of when people go from one to 10, um, based on a situation that it wouldn't normally make sense to react at a level 10 to. So um, it's important to help people while they're in a safe space get out of their emotional and thought chaos um, and work to calm themselves down. Uh, most of the time people feel very out of control and that's something that we can help them with. It's in a safe space, learn how to regain control and bring it back down. That's part of um, befriending their, themselves and their body again and getting to know themselves. Um, so really what we're trying to do is help people um, build escape roads out of their, um, their moments of like hyper arousal or terror or those kinds of things. Um, the example in here especially would be like the coping box, coming up with different, lots of different tools that especially children can use to, to help with that um, and to work on self-soothing. That's another uh, part of it is that um, Self-soothing is just when you are really just um, like nice to yourself, like comforting to yourself. You don't have to go externally to, to do that. That's an incredibly important lifetime skill that we can help with. The next section in the guide is empathy. And this section is to really highlight the importance of being able to connect to the feelings and experiences of others. And we want to just also acknowledge that this is one of the core foundational pieces, especially in prevention, and I think it's also true in advocacy, that takes a long time to develop. So you'll notice that there are not 
as many activities in this section, and that's because empathy building should be happening within all of the lessons. There are plenty of opportunities through the way that you model your facilitation, the way you either uh, appreciate or challenge interactions between other young people that really help to teach empathy lessons. So the ones we selected here are really focused solely on building empathy, but really that it should be a component um, throughout work with young people mm -hmm. because we know that survivors may experience distrust, focusing on empathy can help connect them to other people and that's so valuable. And then on the prevention side, that empathy is one of the known risk factors for perpetration, or empath empathetic deficits, I'm sorry, I should say, is a risk factor for sexual violence perpetration, mm -hmm. and that protective factors do include empathy and concern for how one's actions affect others. Yes. And so for, for advocates, um, we especially, we know that we operate from a place of empathy, that it's um, one of our um, core values, one of our basic rules um, for advocates is we stay, we come from an empathetic place. Um, and as such, we should understand that empathy is, um, it's just, it's part of how we promote direct communication, community building, just how we, in our ideal version of the world, people would interact with each other. Um, child survivors are not exceptions to this. They, they need the same support in developing empathy that we all need um, to, as a, um, that we all need to and an ongoing skill that we're never done building our empathy or uh, continuing to practice empathy. Um, so that's like the advocate side of this. The next section is boundaries and consent. This is a pretty obvious uh, category in the work that we do. So these activities are really focused on communication strategies, um, building healthy boundaries, and that consent is a skill that requires practice. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the key pieces here that can often be a barrier for folks when they hear the word consent is thinking that it only applies to engaging in sexual activity. Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna say that you shouldn't maybe be having some conversations about sexual activity with kids who are approaching the tween and teen age range, you should, but I want to also just really encourage non-sexual consent conversations and that it really can be an age-appropriate skill to build. If you think about any skill that you have to practice, the more you practice it, the better you get at it. And the things that are less intimidating are easier to start with. So if we really prepare our young people with robust practice on consent about everyday life, about all interactions, it's going to be a lot easier for them to apply it to sexuality. Because even though we want to think we're doing all this, you know, good messaging, we have to also know that there are really challenging societal messages about sex, sexual entitlement, uh, gender expectations around sexuality. And while we're doing our best to infiltrate those messages, they're very strong too. So really giving kids a solid foundation in empathy and consent is going to put them at a much better place for then applying it when they start having sexual activity as well. And so these activities really are starting from a base level of valuing consent and boundaries. And that, like I mentioned before, while empathy is not the title of this section, it is really woven into the core of all of these activities as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so for advocacy, some, um, some considerations for this is um, modeling good consent. Um, in all of advocacy, regardless of what survivor um, age that we're working with, we can model this by just doing everything with permission. How we phrase things, um, how we move forward with projects, how we keep things open um, to disagreement with our clients is really important. It can be really helpful with that. Um, so for example, if you want to try to work on something, how you phrase it is really important. If it's okay with you, can we practice whatever? Um, and keeping that open to you, to hearing no. Also talking to your client at some point, having very direct, tangible conversations can be very useful. Um, so for example, when I've worked with child clients in the past, um, I've had some conversations with them about like, how, how do you want to say no in general to people in the world? How do you want to say no to like your parents? How do you want to say no to me? Is there a way that you want to say no to me that I will that I will know that I that's what you're trying to communicate? Um, 
And that can be really important, especially for survivors, because often they feel like their attempt at asserting boundaries and their attempt at specifically not giving consent has been ignored. It wasn't helpful. Um, so working to um, reestablish that there, there could be value for them to re-explore um, how they want to say yes and how they want to say no um, in all aspects of their life. So one of the activities we wanted to mention that we think is useful to think about in this section is called the Solar System, and it's created by an organization called Home Alive, and it's a really useful tool to use in both advocacy and prevention settings, and so we wanted to just pick that one out to share with you a little bit more. So we think that it does a really good job at helping young people explore all of the places in their family and in their network and in their school that they can get emotional support from, that they can feel like they can establish strong boundaries with. It helps differentiate the different type of boundaries throughout their solar system. Um, it can be a really useful tool uh, in a group setting as well as a one-on-one -on -one setting as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, some parts about this to highlight are, yes, um, especially for advocates, everyone, but um, definitely for advocates, being ready um, to incorporate non-traditional ideas of what a support system or family might look like. Um, so a child might include a pet. An adult actually might include a pet. Um, so those kinds of things. So just remembering that um, there's not one way to have a, a system. The next section in the guide is gender expectations. So this section is focusing on really kind of expanding the cultural and gender norms that exist in our society, challenging stereotypes, supporting non-binary expression, and then thinking about the way that these cultural and gender expectations impact a survivor's experience, impact all young people's experience, developing a sense of self, developing relationships, and then specifically targeting really rigid binary norms and hypermasculinity, as these are deeply connected to risk factors for sexual violence perpetration as well. Yes, um, my my main addition um, from an advocate perspective um, is that um, this will be one of you know, your clients in general favorite topics most of the time. Um, people really want to understand why something happened to them, um, and exploring what happens culturally um, that contributed to it can be really helpful. Um, we don't directly challenge when someone um, feels like it's their fault. Um, we can. This is one way that we can do that in a way that still validates and honors their experience and their feelings by by talking about how, in the culture that we have right now, sexual violence is incredibly common and supported. And here are all the ways. Do you, does that make more sense now to to maybe rethink about how this was only your fault? Um, be able to to do it in that kind of way. That's a really great example. And, you know, I think that just ties into the idea, too, that while there are some really widespread mainstream ideas around gender, it's going to also there are different gendered messages in every community. And so making sure, again, that you've really tapped into who your audience is and how you're going to have this conversation based on the cultural norms of your audience is a really important piece to think about as you look at the activities in this section, think about whether or not they work at all, and then, or do they need any adaptation? The next section is relationships. So we want to help promote healthy and supportive relationships with peers, future dating partners, and adults. Mm -hmm. So this is not just a healthy relationship dating section. This is taking the idea of a healthy relationship and really pulling it apart to look at all of the relationships young people have in their lives that do have really big impacts on them. Yes. Um, so, for example, um, research is really showing that um, if child survivors of uh, trauma, so the whole gambit of possible trauma experiences, um, have even one supportive relationship. Um, so, for example, if they can answer the question, did someone while you were a child make you feel special? Did you feel loved by by someone, um, the people that are able to answer that with at least one person, we see um, they have a much lower risk for very complicated future disorders, such as um, like eating disorders or uh, self-harm and things like that. So it can be incredibly useful to build these relationships as a resiliency factor. 
Also, when we think about the idea of young people moving towards the likelihood of wanting to date, it's a lot easier to build healthy ideas about that from the start than change them later. Mm -hmm. So if we start having these ideas about the complexities of healthy relationships across the board and really start giving people some ideas to challenge some of the maybe expectations about dating before they start doing it, it can be a lot easier for them to build a sense of um, a good foundation at that point than trying to undo it when they're 16 or 17 and um, things are pretty reinforced by their peer group. Um, but also, that peer group is so important too. So this section also is helping to prepare groups of young people to move into stages where they are able to reinforce the healthy and positive norms instead of you know, leaning into some of the more damaging ones that can be built into social norms. Uh, yes, and so um, my last little addition is just, um, I, I always like to flag, um, especially when it comes to childhood survivors, um, in the cases of incest or when it's um, uh, someone who is close to the family, um, ideas about relationships and their peer groups are going to change vastly. Um, so also making sure that we're able to have these conversations about what this what this changing family structure or what this changing uh, friendship structure can look like for them and supporting them with that. Um, also making sure, too, that we understand um, that when people don't feel like they have a community or someone to, uh, to support them, the more support that they can have, obviously, the lower risk for things like um, the, the cycle of victimization, the cycle of perpetration, um, those kinds of things. So we're also working, we're also looking to react to the current event and then also try to mitigate any risks for future victimization. And the last section with activities is the sexual development and bodies. And this is a really important piece, even though for some people they kind of defer to the idea that these kids are too young to talk about that. So we really want to challenge that notion with this section to really emphasize the importance of accurate information and critical skills to think about sexual development and social norms, to really acknowledge that all humans are built or born with a sexual identity, mm -hmm. and that all people are going to explore that on their own timeline and in their own way, but it is a natural part of human bodies, and that that should be explored without bias and judgment. Now, there's a lot of shaming that sometimes goes along with body parts for young people as they learn about what are they called, what are they used for, why do I have these ones and people have some that look different. Or um, That's a natural part for children to want to explore, and I think it's really important that advocates and preventionists have some room to do that. We understand there are going to be restrictions. There may be some pieces that feel really scary as a staff person to engage in. And so we also want to add that in addition to this section, that if it is one of those topics that you feel nervous about, to first really take some time mm -hmm. to get a little more comfortable with that topic. So then you can really reconnect with the, with the objectives in this section to really distinguish what healthy sexual development can look like for children. Yes, um, and that, you know, um, is uh, echoed in advocacy, um, definitely. Um, one thing that we see uh, is after an assault, sometimes people, as their bodies change, especially even for young children, their bodies start to change. Um, they have a lot of questions. They have a lot of concerns. They don't necessarily like it. Um, you know, they don't know who they can talk to about it. Um, they might have a parent who's on the same page with them who is also really afraid of their, their body changing and developing. Um, so advocates can provide accurate and like accurate and safe information in a friendly way, right? The more we normalize this, the more that we're like talking about menstruation, not a big deal. We can do it. The more people feel like they can and that they can like, talk about their concerns or they can gain information about it so it becomes less of a scary thing. But if we get really like nervous about it, they're like, oh, I don't know how to talk about it, or I don't know how to say these words. Um, we really just enforce then that this is a scary space, this is a, a scary topic, these are inappropriate things to think about or ask questions about. And a tool that you might find useful back in that last section of the appendix 
there's a really easy to follow chart that was developed by the National Sexual Violence Resource Center uh, that overviews childhood sexual development and stages, behaviors, questions that might come up into uh, based on age groups. So that's something to, to really look through, I think, to be prepared when there are questions. And there may be some that you either feel you don't have enough information to answer or you don't feel you're the appropriate person to answer, but the real takeaway is how you deliver that information. You can still not answer the question and really reinforce the value that it was an asked question mm -hmm. and that it's great that question was asked and that you want to support that person in getting those answers. And either you'll help them do it later or you'll help them find the person who can do that. Mm -hmm. And it, so we just really want to reinforce that it's not about having all the answers to these things at all. It's really about being open to kids naturally wanting to explore these topics and the way that you can value their willingness to, to engage in that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then my, one of my last comments overall is um, if it's possible, um, both um, physically and then within the physical space that you're in, um, to incorporate aspects of movement in, uh, in each of these activities when it seems appropriate or when the client wants to. Um, that can be really helpful too and really important that we want, really want to focus on um, that movement is helpful. Um, so when we play, we might also physically play or dance. Um, that can be how you end your session is you can dance to Taylor Swift with your client. That is fine. That's great. Um, yeah, that kind of thing. Movement is great. And so the last section in the guide is the appendix of additional resources. And these are really designed for you as a staff person to get a little more information, to feel a little more comfortable. Uh, they're listed here. We've got some things about child development. We've got this great 10 core concepts of child sexual abuse prevention from our sister close, uh, coalition in Wisconsin. We've got some national resources. So um, please feel free to utilize those that make sure you feel more comfortable. And that's the last section of the toolkit. So we want to know, do you have anything you want to share with us that's really been helpful in your work? Do you have any questions that you want to ask us? This is, we've got five minutes left in the webinar today, and we're happy to take as much questions as we can. And of course, Sarah and I are always available to chat with you offline after the webinar as well. And no, we cannot provide you with the kitten on the screen. Sarah and I would really love if that was a part of our advocacy provision was bringing you a kitten, but I don't believe that it is something we could probably hold true to, so we don't want to make any false promises. <laughs> oh, we've got someone sharing that. Mm -hmm. They really love using the website, loveisrespect.org, and that um, is one that we use as well, and I'll post it here in the chat for all to see. What about other folks? In addition to the things that we've shared with you today, are there some really great resource sites or places of information that you use in your work that you think others would like to know about? Okay, well, we will share our email addresses with you. So please, like we said, follow up with us if you have any questions about the guide or where to find resources or if there are other related child advocacy and prevention topics that you need support in. We really appreciate you joining with us today um, and hope that the guide is useful for you. We've had a lot of fun making it and are really excited to hear about how other folks are using it if they do decide to use it. And we see we have one hand raised here. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute all the lines for just a minute so our um, person with their hand raised can ask their question if they're not able to use the chat feature. The conference has been unmuted. 
Well, are there any uh -huh. questions that folks want to share to the phone lines now that your line is unmuted? Will you tag something? I don't know, man. Yeah. Do you usually do? Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have posted the wrap-up of the station on the phone for you. Get an email that verifies your attendance, and you can print out for your training hours. It should hopefully also include the quick, quick, quick Survey Monkey evaluation link and a copy of the slides. We'll also post this recording on our website within about a week. So if you want to share it with others or if you missed something, you can use it that way as well. And thank you again for attending. Can you eat it, right? Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.